This is a buffalo uh, yearling. The, the teepee is made from two or three year old heifer hides or cow hides, cow buffalo hides. I was going to show that buffalo doesn't have hair, it's wool. And wool is solid, you can spin it. I have a short section of rope here. When, with this teepee that is behind us that I'm going to describe later, all the hair, or wool rather, it was scraped off. Um, and you can see hair stubble when we show that later. The tool that I use is a Wahintka, same thing they've used for hundreds of years. It's an elk horn scraper. Um, here would be the head of an elk, and then you have a brow tine, and up a short distance you have the second tine. That's where the, it's cut in and the blade fits, and then up here the horn starts whying. This is what I use to scrape all the hair or wool off. And it's also the same tool to take the fat and meat off the, the buffalo. Um, this uh, wool that we took off, um, we spin it. This is just a short section show that it's 16 strands. They're doubled to be eight. And then the eight are hand braided and it becomes a square rope. So this is the kind of rope they sometimes use on teepees or on the lining or just th uh, around their horse's mouth for guiding them. And this is a one that's all hand tanned. We're using that same kind of Elkhorn scraper. On here is a quilled strip that I put. A quilled strip for a man would be down the center. Women had quilled rows on their robes. This one has the head, because they believe when you kill an animal for a personal wearing robe, if you cut the head off, you lost the power. So the ears are still on the inside. They thought the animal was still listening. The nose has been sewn shut. You see it on this side, too. But this hide was skinned out differently than done today. Uh, today, when they skin on an animal, they do a center cut, and then on the inside of the legs, they go to that center cut. The Indians, though, long ago, instead of being here, they were on the outside of the leg. And they skin out the back of the leg and then back to the armpit and then up. This line here, this center cut, produces this line right here. And because it's skinned that way, it makes the side of the buffalo fairly straight. On a modern day a buffalo hide, the leg would hang off to the side here. And there'd be a big hollow behind the leg. You couldn't do a teepee with modern day skinning because you'd have a big hole or hollow and the leg would be off here. But this way it makes the side straight and it fills in the whole neck area. Where this is skinned out on the teepee, you're going to see little dangles on the other side. This is also on with sinew. And this is a quill strip. Quill work came before beads. Uh, these are porcupine quills. The red dye that we use comes from a little bug on prickly pear cactus that we have out west. The yellow comes from a weed called curly dock. The little purple comes from wild grapes. So you dye them. You flatten them in your teeth after you dye them. And you sew them down with two sinew threads. The sinew that we use is the back muscle. And the teepee is all sewn with this same muscle. All animals, uh, here's the backbone of an animal. And along the backbone, there's this tendon that connects from the hip to the shoulder blade. And you have one on the other side of the backbone, too. From this, we pull it apart a little bit like this to separate them. And these are strands. You can make them thin like this for doing that kind of sew down work. But for a teepee, you have to go heavier. So with my fingernail, I split them, followed up. Follow it down. Then we wet it. If you don't wet it, it becomes like a piece of cable. And then we gently twist it like this. And then with this end, you poke a hole with an awl, then you stick this through to do the sewing. You need to poke another hole and stick this through. There's no knots in this teepee, so over the end. I teach college classes uh, about the culture of long ago, the Native American uh, culture. And I usually hold this up somewhere and ask them what animal it is. And I point out the white here on the sides. I ask them what animal it is. I've never had anyone ever guess it. They guess oh, Texas prairie dog or all kinds of things. But wh what I do is deceive them. This white actually becomes black. This is a baby buffalo calf. They're born orange. 
um, and then they become blackish um, or blonde, real chocolate color. Um, on this buffalo calf hide, this is what a child would wear to keep warm. And the adults would have that bigger robe that I showed you. But what they also did is they kept track of their tribal history here. Long ago, when a Lakota or a Dakota would be asked when, when they were born, they wouldn't give a year because they had no number system as we do. Instead, they would give the event, like the year the meteorites fell from the sky. That would be something on a pictograph, and then they would then count the number of events after that. Then that would tell you how old they were. So this is an important documentation for tribal history. This I use for showing my family history. You would draw one picture, you start with the picture of the most important thing that happened that year. Then you would draw a picture for the next year, and next year, and the next year, and so forth. You could keep going in spiral. And I did this as a family history of my family. This is 1918 when my aunt and uncle were married. And this is a building with little lines, that's wisdom. That's when the first time anyone in our family graduated from high school. We have different things happening. Every year, the most important thing, and you see tractors here. Uh, there's World War I, World War II on here. Um, here's when I graduated from college and became a teacher. Here I'm teaching, I'm pointing to the chalkboard. So you keep going. Here's when I worked on dances with wolves. I was the Indian technical advisor. I made most of the, or much of the props used in that movie and other movies after that. And then you come to more modern times, you have this. I've, everybody seems to be able to guess this. This is the Twin Towers attack. And then uh, we had a grandson being born here. My son and daughter-in-law are both smoke jumpers there, and that's what these are, parachutes. They got married in the Baja of California. We come to more modern times, and this is last year. The most important thing that happened to anybody's recollection, or were all the floods that happened throughout the United States, and actually the tsunami that happened in uh, Japan. So now, this next year, at the end of this year, we'll draw a picture here. So this is our family history. This is a very rare teepee maker's bundle. We didn't know such a thing exists, although we do, did know that women direct the making of teepee. At least one person would direct it. Uh, and so she was honored and given gifts for her direction of the teepee. But this is a bundle that I was asked to write an article about. And I have to return this by um, in another day. But he sent me this so I could write about it because otherwise the family didn't know any more what it was used for. But since I make buffalo eye teepees, everything in here was pretty clear to me. But we'll start with the bag first. It's made out of buffalo calf. It has that real fine hair. And this is from about 1860s to 1870 that this bundle was actively employed by this woman who was director of what's called Teepee Maker's Bundle. Um, the beadwork on the side, this was um, robbed from another piece. I can see um, that it was just added to it. But inside are the important ingredients for her direction. This is sinew. It's been doubled over. Uh, so I could get in, stay in here. So she would have extra sinew. But this is, um, but they didn't know what this was all about. This is very clear. This is a string of uh, buckskin. It's made from a semi-tanned hide so it won't stretch. And there are two things in here that I recognize because I do it about the same way. Okay, you have, when you set up a teepee, you stick this in. It's the other way around. This goes in. This is to swing the arc to know. A teepee is a half circle. So you would stick this in the ground. And then this first point out here, about three feet out, is a second hole. That's would show where, how far out the ear flap goes to the side. It's this hole here. And that would be with this. And the reason you, this is a bone awl, and this, when you do a buffalo hide, if you press, it leaves a scribe. You see, I just, if I move it a line, you don't use a pencil, you use um, 
indentation that will stay there so you can then cut it or if you don't like it you can move it but you don't use a actual marking instrument because it would show on the height so this is a pivot point so this is a TP is a half circle and so this first point is how far out the ear flap would go which is that hole here it is and this would be scribing the, the line to show where that would go this would be on the ground and then the further out you go you'd move it to the very not quite at the end out about 12 feet here's your hole this is where you swing your line to make the the arc of the teepee a teepee is not a true half circle maybe i can um, uh, show on this hide here how you do it how you mark out a teepee but um, so this is to, to make the lines for their teepee, the first one being the ear flap, the further one to be the circle. Uh, let me indent on here. To make a teepee, I would put a pin in the ground here, a peg, and I would stretch a straight line to another peg over here. Now, if I put a pivot point somewhere in the middle and would swing a line, I would have a teepee like, like here. It'd be a half circle. But they didn't want a teepee to be a half circle. They want to be tilted. So instead of, here's the line, instead of being in the center line, I'll move it up a distance. Now when I swing that line, it's still essentially the same point, but now the line is going to be shorter in the back and then back to full size here. That makes a tilted cone. And the ear flap that I was speaking about, if this is the pivot point, you have one ear flap here, and this line that I was mentioning before, that tells me, tells her, how far out to add this piece right in here. And then you have an ear flap on this other side too. That tells her that other point. And then that distant point makes a circle. Now on this marker, there are nine little indentations. This is indicating that she helped with nine, directing the making of nine buffalo teepees on this one. And this is just, uh, just to, to uh, hold in the holes. So these are important parts of making a teepee. Then you had, you didn't have scissors. You can't cut a hide very well. This is an old knife. It's curved. This is a, to cut the hide. We need to, you can either pull it or push, a, push whatever it takes. But this is a very sharp instrument, but necessary to, to cut the hides in order to sew the teepee. Then this is diatomaceous earth. It's a soft material. It's not clay. It's very soft. This is, when you do a high TV, if something got dirty, this would be rubbed to make it whiter, to cover out, cover over anything dirty. And the last part is very interesting. This is a fungi that grows on ash. It grows on um, just a few other trees. It's very soft. But you can see it's been burned. And when you make a buffalo teepee, if all the women are, are sewing with sinew and they're using all, it's very tedious, very hard on the eyes, especially when the sun is bright overhead, you have this glare and you easily get a headache. If you burn this and then smell the, the vapors, that is supposed to get rid of your headache. So this is for women. The women got headaches while working on this teepee in the bright sunlight. This is to cure that problem. Uh, this uh, is a, a little over an eight-foot teepee, and this is the size teepee you'd use for hunting camps. Um, two or three people could live in it. This would be in the days of the dog, the dog days. Those were the bad days. That's called the dog days because the dogs did all the work. The dogs carried the poles. The dogs carried the teepee, dragged it, rather. And then when the horses came, then it made life easier. Then you start going with taller teepees, and the horses pulled things. This teepee only weighs about 35 pounds, so it's not heavy. The poles are special. They come from the Black Hills. They're lodgepole pine. They're very slender, but they're very tough. They don't develop a lot of side limbs, so they, they would travel quite a distance to get poles for the teepees. Uh, these are very lightweight. Um, now, these are choke cherry pins that support the two halves together when we set it up. Uh, when you look at a buffalo teepee, um, if you see a line coming down, that is the backbone of the buffalo. 
There's one on the other side. <clears throat> that's a stiffer part. And then there's a spot where you might see it's a little stiffer. That's the, the hump of the buffalo. It's a, a pocket. You have to allow it to dry. And so it becomes a little more rigid right there. But that's a, the hump of the buffalo. And here's the other hump of the buffalo. And when I lay the hides in, there's a certain way to lay the hides in. Um, the, I've done 52 buffalo teepees. And I had to see how the hides are sewn because you don't just, it's not like a quilt where you just put pieces in. There's a certain way that you put the hides in. I went to see the, the ones in museums. There's only about <clears throat> 10 buffalo teepees genuine in the whole world, only 10. What happened to them is over the years in storage, they, they were gotten away and they just threw them out, especially in the 1930s when we call that the dirty 30s. Museums didn't have any space. They didn't have any money to care for these, so they threw them away. So that's why there's only just about a handful of teepees left in the whole world genuine. But I've learned to replicate them, and when I saw the few that are in existence, I kept noticing these little dangles on old teepees. I thought at first they were just putting some decoration on them. They're just sticking some buckskin there. But what I noticed is there's always sewing before I see this part here. Then I found an old reference by a mountain man. He said he wished that the other mountain men would skin out buffalo the way the Indians had because it was given a square shape. And then I realized what was happening is they were skinning out the buffalo instead of skinning them out on the inside like today. They skin out animals on the inside of the legs. They were on the other side, not here, but on, they started on the other side go through the knee, and then they would head straight down to the armpit and then over. This part here, this straight line, is where it's sewn. So the leg became sewn to the, here's the, here's the hump of the buffalo, here's the neck of the buffalo, the leg is sewn to the neck. So instead of the leg sticking out, the leg becomes forward, you would sew that together, and you have to trim a little bit away because it won't quite meet exactly. What you trim away rather than throwing it away they allowed it to be on there. So that's your decoration. So when I saw that on old TVs and studied them, I saw, oh, there's a pattern to how these are laid out. And I described that in my book. There's a uh, methodology to this. And it all makes sense. They were very economical with what hide they had so they didn't waste material. Now this part here is interesting. Um, when that buffalo are skinned out, sometimes the skinners, because these are very thin hides, these are female and they're rather thin, because it makes the teepee lighter weight than if you use a big bull buffalo hide. Um, sometimes they put holes. When you have a big cut like that from skinning, you, when I scrape it away, I couldn't quite get close enough, so I just had to leave it. And you see that in old teepees too. So that's just a remnant of buffalo wool. So you can see what buffalo wool is like. And that's um, uh, that part there. Here's another skinning cut. Again, you can't... Um, get the hair real close, you get as close as you can, can with the scraper. So all these lines on this teepee are from my Elkhorn scraper. So I scrape the wool off, and then I tan the hide, and then I sew it inside out. My sewing is visible here. I use that sinew, and I, don't, I, I poke a hole, and I sew over the end, I allow a little bit of the end to remain. I sew over the end twice, but I don't use a knot. And I keep sewing, and these are real small stitches. They're just like if you're doing a quilt uh, with, that, with that tendon, you can get about this far, and then you tuck it underneath and you start the next one. But there are no knots in this teepee. This is sewn, this is another. This is where I got another one here. So it's real tight. So on this side, you, you have a seam that won't leak when it rains. When it, rains, the hide swells, and it, it never leaks inside the teepee. When it rains up there, I have it fairly well closed off, but if, if, uh, if it was a nice sunny day and you want a little more um, smoke to come out, you'd move those two ear flap poles. There are little pockets up there. And at the end of the pockets, um, there are buffalo beards. Um, and the rest of the teepee is um, way up there on top is a buffalo tail. The buffalo tail identified the lifting ornament, and it's right above the doorway. So it's a symbolic thing.
but it also identifies when you have the poles on the ground, you know which one is the lifting pole. And it shows the person of prominence to have that. Only certain people sometimes are, were allowed to have a tail up there. Other people had other things. 